making them through cleaning water from rain usually and making them energy because sometimes there is also housing involved. So these sculptures up there are some examples of some of the ecosystems. On the very top left, there's a sculpture called Bull, and I'll go forward and show you a little better image of that. So this is part of it. It's Whole is a two-part ecosystem that's made with two spheres. You can see one of them up there. And it was part performance and part sculpture where me and about six people carried these spheres through Havana, Cuba, and set them up in two different places. And inside of the spheres, they contained ecosystems including birds who already live in cages. And we allowed them to live inside of the thick walls of the structure that were bigger than their cage. Um, also, there were fish in fish tanks and inedible perennial foods. So the birds actually ate some of the edible perennials and their droppings would go into the fish tank, so it was kind of a miniature cycle um, of life support. So that's one example. Um, so I also work in photography, like I said, and this is an example of, of photography as a proposal for something. So this would be a proposal for a potential future. And this is course collage. So another way that I use photography is, is to document sculptures. So this is a document of, of a sculpture that I made called Water Pod that I'll talk about a little bit later. And then I also use photography as an element in a sculpture. So bundling them all up into these large boulders uh, that I then use for performance. So this is pole again. This is a way that sculpture can be used as performance. This is a, another project called Wetland, and this is a way that sculpture can be used as a monument to, in this case, loss. So we're thinking about how environmental change is, is affecting spaces. And it's supposed to look like it's a house sinking from the top. Inside of it, it contains an artist residency, so people can spend two weeks to two, two nights there. Uh, this is a sculpture as an experience. So this is a bridge that was partially underwater in Des Moines, Iowa, in a river called the Raccoon River. That river is floods all the time. It's, Iowa is where a lot of the food for the U.S. is grown. Um, so because of the intense farming, um, the water is structured in a way so that all access water just goes right into the river. So it floods. People in general are a little bit, I'd say, nervous about going down to the waterfront to this river in particular because of how often it floods and how much runoff from farming is in this water. So you can see all the nitrates that pool up around the edge of that um, bridge. And the idea was that here's a way to get into the water briefly to experience it. So I started doing this work um, I grew up in a farming town on the border of Connecticut and Massachusetts where the water was, um, where we couldn't drink the water because it was filled with a chemical called DDT that was used in farming. Um, especially, this is throughout the 80s and still residuals in the 90s. And finally the town was moved off of well water and into a city water system. But for a long time we had to buy bottled water. So I thought about that through growing up and then when I moved to go to college, was around the time when water started to be privatized in different countries. And I was thinking about how that would affect the United States and how with the growing bottled water industry, this could happen here. So a lot of the work that I made in college had to do with water cleaning and purifying and um, trying to make things that were both sculptural but um, could also be tech objects and that could be wearable. So I started to design these things that were that I called wearable homes. They were three different systems um, for three different extreme environments. So a desert environment, a waterlogged environment, and then an environment that would be almost like an arctic tundra. So they could be worn during the day, and then at night they could become tents. Well, these are just some images of the potential future where there's more desertification and where potentially you have to wear these suits. So it was a depiction of a more dystopic future. And then this is an actual space. So this is actually on the border of Mexico in a town called Yuma, Arizona. There are a lot of 
of um, water filling stations, and this is one of them. So putting that into this body of work, you know, you think about in photography, you're making a series of works that tell a story. It's a, it's a different way of telling a story. So including things that are manipulated with things that are proposals, um, including sculptures with things that just that are just documents. You can tell a story. You can sort of start to create a story. And this, the idea here was that this could be maybe like a McDonald's in the future. Maybe they're everywhere in the future. Um, so including each picture that was included in this work was uh, included for a reason to tell a story about the future. So I'll go through these pictures. This is the dust storm. People using these suits. So I worked on this until about 2006, and that was right around the time of Hurricane Katrina um, in Louisiana. And then all this stuff that I was thinking about and was trying to depict in pictures became real. So I started to try to figure out how, what photography could do at that point. How could a photograph still interrogate something like this? Uh, what are the methods that you could use to um, kind of enforce our positions within within the contemporary kind of disaster that, that we're seeing over and over. So this is a collage of tourism um, with disaster scenarios, disaster scenes actually. Some of them are created and some of them are not. And that took me to really thinking about how sculpture could be more functional. So instead of trying to represent what was going on, I really started to try to imagine a different world and how we could live in a different way so that we would possibly not have to re represent um, things because maybe they would be, maybe these storms could be happening less, for example. So I started to um, create this project called the Water Pod Project, and this is the first image from it. Um, this was you know, a picture that I made in 2006. I really wanted to create this living system where um, people could live inside of, live on the water in New York City, and that's where I was living at the time. And I thought, I was thinking about my own life and how I was working several jobs and trying to also time, do better time management so I could, say, grow my own food, collect my own water, um, live in a way that could be, that could cost less, and then at the same time live more ecologically and holistically within a city where I was really concentrating on how much, um, how much this a city like New York has to use in a day, where that comes from, and then once we use it, where it goes back to. So a lot of times it's going back to the same place that it, that it was made, and a lot of times in New York City it's going back to the highest bidder, right? So whoever can take over the landfill. So the idea was that if we could make a system where we could use less and draw attention to it which could happen if you did something on the water, then maybe this could slowly start to, to change the thinking of a place like New York. So it's a big ask. Um, so I started by going to the Coast Guard. Someone told me that if I wanted to do a project like this, I needed to talk with the US Coast Guard. So I called them, and they kind of laughed, but they still uh, allowed me to have a meeting with them. And through the meeting, they told me that I should go to the Department of Education and talk with some students, try to get a better idea for what can actually happen um, through following their guidelines and trying to redesign something that was um, already, that wasn't out of the realm of possibility. They said designing something like a sphere would take 10 years of time, it would cost millions of dollars. And maybe I could go with a pre-made structure that they already gave give permission to. So I started, um, by working with students and asking them the question, what would your water pod look like and how would it function? And, you know, after doing that for six months, we came up with a much better design. And we're really, here we are using these uh, modular planters and the geodesic dome, which is a lot easier to build. You know, it's more of an assembly project than a building project. It's a way to make spaces kind of quickly that are already pre-engineered. So I really wanted this to be a proposal for interdependent structures within a city like New York. And think about how 
within a city that, that is that big, we could all be sort of supplying a little bit of, um, say, food or, say, this water collection or, say, energy making, and then kind of function without putting so much stress on the global supply chain, which I think we could reevaluate at this stage. So another thing about the space I should mention is that it was really important that it was on a boat for several reasons. One is because the water is still considered a commons in the city. It's one of the few commons left, although it's, there are jurisdictions from many different groups who oversee the water. It is still technically a commons. Um, so still, you could build something and float it. You know, it's not like you, you don't need to buy the land to do it, essentially. Another reason is it's sort of a magical space. You get onto a boat and it's moving all the time. You have to collaborate with people in order for it to stay afloat. And at the same time, you're able to see an ecosystem working in microcosm on a structure like a boat. So over the course of a couple of years, we learned that we would have to get 15 different permits to be on the water. <laughs> And that included a permit for each dock that we wanted to stop at, included the funniest one that I mentioned before, I think, the most absurd is a permit to have four chickens be photographed. So everything needed a permit from, you know, the water that we were going to be drinking, the Department of Health needed a permit, to um, the structure itself. We found that I had to open up an LLC, I had to insure it, I had to hire a team of lawyers who fortunately worked for free on this project, and um, all in order to sort of make something in this commons, which seemed to be funny, but it just took a long time. So these are some of the permits. I thought, at a certain point, I thought that they became, um, they told the story better than a photograph could tell the story. And finally, after working on permits for years, we were able to build this project out. We ended up um, having to rent a barge for a very low price um, through a company called Weeks Marine, and we were able to build out in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, essentially um, all entirely from scratch, from scraps. So we talked with Sims Metal Management, a place in the Bronx. We got um, wood from the Department of Parks and were able to essentially assemble the structure on top for no cost, but for a lot of volunteer labor. Um, and the same, some of the same students who helped us plan the design in the beginning actually were able to plant the seedlings that we then ate. So it was great to, you know, a couple of years later get to reconnect with some of those students and they actually grew the food that we ended up eating. And this is what it finally looked like. So it launched in the summer of 2009. It visited 12 piers in the five boroughs. Um, over the course of the project, 200,000 people roughly came to see the pod. So over six months, that works out to about 500 people a day. So we had visitors all the time and um, were able to explore this living system with them. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what's going on up here. So that big dome it was our public space. Um, on the left, next to it, there are four cabins that we lived in um, for the six months. So I lived on there with four intrepid friends who are also artists. Um, the gardens run around the perimeter. There are four chickens for, for fresh eggs. We collected rainwater. You can see the tank in the very um, right side. Um, and then there were, there's a kitchen, a shower, a dry composting toilet, and All the water that we used in the shower and the kitchen went through a gray water system, so it was recleaned and we were able to use it again in the gardens. So this is, these are just other images of the water pod structure, so you can see um, we used reused billboards and everything. Um, that's when we're docked over, you can see New Jersey in the background, Elizabeth. Do you guys have any questions about this project before I move on to another? What month were you on this? 
We started in June and uh, that's not fair. Um, uh, we started in June and we went through November. So we, yeah, we were trying to get permission to go through the winter, but we actually didn't build it. Do you have a plan to bond with that? Yeah, we would have to greenhouse most of it. But it would have been a great experiment to try and see if, if we had more time, we could have reused our compost and done another season of gardening. And then after years, seeing how well that works, after repeated compost making and stuff like that. So, so I think I have this slide and it's, this was a glorious moment where we were actually considered a park by the city. So they allowed us to be a public park, gave us a sign. I'll show you a, sh a really short video this is about the water pod. This is some filmmakers came on one day in Staten Island and shot this video. And I think it's a good description of what it was like. Um, the moment I go to bed, throughout my dream cycle, to the moment I wake up, it's impossible to not become a part of the organism that is made up by all the people, by the plants, by the water, by the sun. It's like every moment that you're on board, you are a part of the system. I think that the water pod can be a positive solution to something that is very foreseeable in the future, which is lack of resources, lack of clean water, lack of usable land. The water pod is a floating sculptural living system that has four residents.